If you find this healing sleep meditation sleep story helpful or interesting, feel free to give it a thumbs up, share with someone who may find it useful and leave any comments below. If you don't want to miss any future sleep stories, you can subscribe and click the bell notification icon. My sleep stories are made with you, for you, and posted weekly here on YouTube. You can access all my sleep stories without this YouTube introduction on most streaming and downloads services like Apple Music, Amazon Music and Spotify. If you're interested in what else I offer, you can find details of all this and of my hypnotherapy and autism e-courses, books and merch in the description and on my website danjoneshypnosis.com. So I hope you enjoy this story. Just take a moment to allow your eyes to close and allow yourself to begin to relax. And as you begin to relax, I'm just going to tell this sleep meditation in the background. And while I tell this sleep meditation in the background, I don't know whether you'll drift asleep faster to the sound of my voice or whether it'll be to the spaces between my words. And as you begin to drift asleep, you can just have a sense of a princess out in her garden one day. And as she's walking around her garden, she often feels very lonely. She walks around and because of her status as a princess. There's high walls around the garden. She's never allowed to see anyone. And whenever she does see people, she always has lots of other people with her, normally between her and the people that she's seeing. And she always has people telling her where to stand who she can see, who she can't see, how long those people can see her for. She feels that people often think that she's the lucky one, living in this palace, having this most beautiful garden. And she often ends up feeling bad for feeling bad, as if somehow feeling like she wants something different in life, is the wrong thing to feel when others think you have everything. And so she keeps a lot of this to herself, and she comes out into her garden. She walks around her garden, the place where she can begin to feel a connection, and feel a sense of being in control of what she's choosing to do. She can walk in among the woodland in the garden. She can stop and listen to a bird in a tree. She can walk over to the pond and sit down on a bench and just gaze out over that pond. And no one comes out into the garden and over to her to tell her not to sit here, not to sit there, not to do this, not to do that. She knows that they're aware of where she is and that they would be aware if she disappeared or didn't return when expected. but they don't follow her in her own garden. And one day while she's walking around her garden, walking through the woodland, and out the other side of the woodland, following a path round, listening to the birds, smelling the smell of the different flowers as she walks past them, with different flower beds, different colours, 
looking at the texture of those different flowers, noticing the way they gently move in the breeze, and the way the breeze lifts certain scents towards her nose that may not even be from the flowers that she can see. And then she sits down on that bench near the pond. And as she sits there, she hears a splosh in the water and can see the riffles spreading out from just around the corner in the pond behind some green leaves. And those ripples spread across the pond, making the most beautiful water lily bob up and down. And as those ripples gradually fade, she notices a frog suddenly jump up from the edge of the pond, from under the water, and land on the grass next to the pond. And that frog hops gently over to the princess and sits on the bench next to the princess. And the princess begins to talk to that frog and is sure that that frog is listening attentively to what she's saying, that the frog looks like it's so interested in what she's saying. And then as it begins to get later, that frog heads back to the pond, jumps in the pond, and then she hears a slight splosh at the other side of the pond, as the frog has probably left the pond to head to its home, wherever that is, somewhere around the side of the pond. And she heads inside. And she has something to eat. And she heads to bed. And the next day, she wakes up, she has certain duties to do. She has to go out, smile, greet people, appear interested in things she doesn't really understand. And she looks forward to her time back in the garden. And when in the garden again, she sits back down near the pond, and once again, that frog comes and joins her. And then, again, as it starts getting late, she heads back inside. And settles down for the night, and drifts comfortably asleep. And day after day, she gets up, eats breakfast, goes through her daily chores, looking forward to the end of the day when she can sit on that bench with that frog. And that she's sure that frog is aware of what it's doing because it joins her every single evening. And it sits there until it starts getting dark. And then they both head away from the bench. And one day as she's walking through the woods in the garden, she wonders what it'd be like to be able to talk with that frog, but have the frog talk back. The frog just seems to sit and listen and it's very attentive at listening. But she wonders whether 
it could ever talk back. We should ever have a two-way conversation, perhaps even finding out what goes on in the frog's life, where the frog lives, what the frog does all day, every day. And she heads to that bench, and she sits on that bench, and that frog appears and sits next to her. And then, when it starts getting late, that frog heads away and she heads off, back in and goes to bed. And months and months pass. And she gets older and older. But instead of getting older and older and getting more and more freedom, the older she gets, the more she finds that people expect things of her. People expect her to do more chores, more duties that aren't of her choosing. And she's always just told it's what you were born to do. Whether you like it or not doesn't matter. You do what you're born to do. And the older she got, the more she began to resent this idea that you have to do what you're born to do when there are other things you would like to be doing instead. And as she begins to get older, she starts to wonder whether, maybe sometime in the future, she can find a way where she's allowed to leave home. And she wonders what people would say, what the consequences of her taking control of her own life would be. And she sits on that bench and she talks it over with that frog. And the frog sits there just listening, like every other night. And then she heads to bed. And every day she sits and talks with the frog. And every night she goes to bed. And during every day she looks forward to her time on that bench. And then one day, while she's walking through the woodland, she notices a slight sparkle coming from what looks like a tiny shoot sprouting from the ground. And there's a slight twinkling sound of bells. She walks over towards that shoot coming up from the ground. And she can see the slightest signs of a new tree breaking through that ground. And that tree seems to be making the sounds of twinkling bells. And as she looks closely, she can see some golden sparkles around the leaves. And she touches that with her fingertips. And as her fingertips touch those tiny leaves, so they start to twinkle like touching tiny bells. And as she touches the stalk of that tree, just the flimsiest of trunks, it's like all the bells sing at once. And a slight cloud of golden sparkles start to spread out from that tree. And she heads off to the pond and sits and talks with the frog. And the next few days, She's so busy, she doesn't have time 
to go and walk through the woods like she's been doing. But she always makes time for the thing she feels is most important, which is sitting on that bench, talking with that frog. And days turn into weeks, and weeks into months. And her schedule's got so busy that she doesn't have much time to walk around the garden, to walk through the woods. But she always makes time for that frog. And then one day, after months of not walking through the woods, she starts to think about that sparkling, twinkling, shimmering tree that was so tiny and delicate. And she walks in through the woods and is surprised to find what almost looks like a wall in the middle of the woods, almost like a giant plank of wood. And then she realizes that it's an enormous trunk of a tree. And where that tiny tree once was only months ago is now an enormous tree stretching way up through the canopy of these woods. And she's wondering why she couldn't see it or didn't notice it from the garden. And she'd never really been one to look up and pay attention. She often walked around with her head down. She would look at the grass and she would look at the plants. But she'd rarely look up at the sky. She always felt that looking up at the sky too often made her think of freedom. Think of the idea of soaring like a bird. And she didn't like focusing too much on freedom when it reminded her of the lack of freedom she felt she had. So she'd walk around trying to appreciate what she's got within what she almost felt was like a prison. And not a prison that was uncomfortable, but a prison that was almost like an illusion that she wouldn't realize that she was restricted until she pushed against the restrictions. And now here she was, faced with this giant tree. And the trunk itself, before the first branch, appeared to be higher than the whole woodland around here. She wondered whether it would be possible to climb this tree, to see what's up there. To see what the view's like from the top. To get a view almost like you were a bird soaring through the sky. And yet having the safety of knowing that you're safely on something that's solid and attached to the ground. And the tree is so large that she could easily grasp handfuls of bark and a bit like a rock climber she was able to find footholds and start to ascend that tree and every time she gripped with a hand or knocked the tree with a foot what looked almost like golden powder would sparkle and twinkle and fall from the tree. And although it was incredibly hard work, she climbed up that trunk until she was higher than the treetops around her. 
and she could see that she still had some distance to climb, just to get to the lowest branch. And as she reached that lowest branch, so she saw some low-hanging fruit. And yet, this giant tree seemed to actually contain giant fruit. And she could see the giant, what looked like oranges, hanging from these low branches. But as she continued to ascend the tree, she noticed there was different fruit hanging from different branches. And she continued to climb. And while she climbed, she saw flowers, the most beautiful flowers in this tree, that were larger than she was. And yet the tree continued going on. And so she climbed higher and higher. And after a while she was climbing, from one branch to another, and she would have to reach up way above her head, grab hold of a branch, and manage to get her footing and pull herself up to that branch. Sometimes she'd have to jump a little, but the branches were so wide that it was just like jumping up a bit on a floor. And the tree felt so solid and secure. And from up here, she stood and hung on to a branch, while standing on another branch, and gazed out over the land. She could see the way the sun caught a distant river, and sparkled and twinkled on the water. She could see distant woodland on the hills rolling away almost into a blueness. She could see people silently milling around in the nearby town. And horse and cart roaming down paths and cutting through the land. And she could see birds flying above the land, and yet she was so high up that many of the birds flying were lower than she was. She was looking down upon birds of prey hovering above fields some circling up in warm updrafts. And she continued ascending this tree, wondering how much further she had to go. She could see as the sun was beginning to set, and she worried that she hadn't spent any time with the frog, and this is the first time in years that she hadn't sat by that pond and talked to the frog. And she had no way of going and telling the frog what she was doing. And she felt a little bit of guilt at not being able to do so, and hoped that she could explain and she'd been climbing for so long. She didn't want to have to go down now, when she might well be near the top. And she noticed as she climbed that the strangest thing was happening, that sometimes she'd make really good progress climbing. And so she would notice the sun beginning to set over the horizon. And then she would turn around, and the sun would be 
back above the horizon again. And then from this higher vantage point, she would see it setting. But then, as she rapidly ascended the tree, she would turn around, and it would be just above the horizon again. And this tree was getting easier and easier to climb, as the branches were getting smaller and smaller. Because as they were getting smaller and smaller, so they were getting more like the branches of a normal tree. And so much easier to reach from one to the next. And she continued up all the way to the top of this tree. And as she reached the top of the tree, she noticed herself heading into a layer of cloud. And she could see that that layer of cloud was there, but it seemed to be just hovering around the top of this tree. And she headed through that layer of cloud. And as she did, the other side of this layer of cloud, almost like passing through dense fog, the sky opened up to the most beautiful blanket of stars. And that blanket of stars was shining down upon the top of the clouds. And the top of the clouds here looked different to what she was expecting. She could see that there seemed to be fairies flying around just above the clouds. And they were disturbing the clouds ever so slightly with the beat of their wings. And she could see that they seemed to be doing something. And as she reached down to the top of the clouds, she felt that it seemed to have some level of solidness to it. And so she reached down with one foot and gently touched the top of the cloud with the foot. And as she did, her foot rested upon it, almost like walking on duvet covers on a bed, that there was a slight springiness to each step that she took. But she was able to walk on this mysterious cloud that sits at the top of the tree. And all the fairies that she could see seemed to just carry on working, doing whatever it was that they were doing. And every now and then she would see a fairy pop up through the cloud little burst or puff of fog. And then it would place something down and then disappear again. And the princess went to the nearest fairy and asked what they were doing. And the fairy appeared a little startled they were so absorbed in what they were doing that they didn't even notice that she had appeared. And they said that there are fairies arriving with different teeth and they leave the teeth up here and the white teeth almost become planted in the cloud. And they sprout, almost like seeds. They sprout little points of gold within the cloud. But each little point of gold actually contains a nugget of magic. And so 
more fairies, pan for those little bits of gold, the clouds are full of water. And that water runs and flows across and through the cloud. And as it seeps down through the cloud, so some of that water starts spilling out of the cloud and rains down on the land below. But as it's flowing along the cloud, they pan for that gold, searching for where the teeth have become golden nuggets. Because it's only once they become golden nuggets they're able to roll and flow, while their teeth, they're slightly spiky on one end, and that sticks them in place. And they absorb the magic of the cloud. The magic of the way the water flows across and through the cloud. But it's only once they've turned to gold that they can then roll and move around. And as the fairy was telling the princess this, so she happened to hear a slight chink in her little pan. And she looked down, and the princess looked down, and in the pan was what looked like a little speck of gold. And the fairy picked that up and said, this is what we're looking for. And occasionally, one of these little nuggets of gold may fall to the ground. And when they do, and if they go unnoticed and we've been unable to find them, they begin to grow but only in the right locations. And the fairy said, it looks like that's what's happened here with you, that one of these little nuggets must have fallen from the clouds. There must be something magical about where it landed, for it to sprout into a tree, to reach itself back up to the clouds. And the fairy, and the fairy explained that they gather up these golden nuggets and they use these golden nuggets to help them to be able to do magic. And not just themselves, but there's an entire magical kingdom, often unseen by others. And it's these little gold nuggets that help to power that whole magical kingdom. And the princess was fascinated by this strange land and by this fairy. And she asked, what kind of magic can you do? And the fairy explained that there's a lot of magic that goes on right under your nose and you don't even notice that when you're a child you're more receptive to that magic you believe in the magic you leave a tooth under a pillow because you believe in magic but as you grow older normally your mind goes off to other things and the magic fades from your life. And some people will continue to believe in magic. And they see magic wherever they look. But the magic we can do is granting wishes, is making certain things come true. 
but sometimes it's not exactly as you would expect. And we don't use our magic unless it's to try and help. And the princess made an off the cuff remark about the frog and how she wishes that she could communicate with that frog and the frog could communicate back. that that frog she's known for many years is like a best friend to her. And the fairy says that that can be done. The fairy says, meet me tomorrow night at that bench where you meet the frog. And then the princess goes and descends that tree and it takes her most of the night to work her way down the tree. And at the bottom of the tree she heads off to that pond and the frog isn't there this late at night and she hopes that the frog is okay with the fact that she wasn't there when she normally is and that the frog didn't worry about her and would understand that had she not been halfway up a tree she would have been there and she knows she'll be there tomorrow night and she heads off to bed for the last couple of hours of the night before waking up in the morning, excited at what the day will bring. But first of all, she has to go out on a special duty. And she's pandered around and made to look all pretty. And she thinks what all these people are doing it's just for their own benefit and what they want her to be. But she lets them get on with their jobs. And then she heads out the front. And out the front waiting for her are two of the most beautiful white horses pulling what almost looks like a crystal or a glass carriage that seems to sparkle as the morning sunlight strikes it. And a person in a white suit is holding the door open. And she heads over, climbs in. The door gets closed behind her. And the horses begin to trot out of the palace grounds and they go on a journey past the nearby town heading off through countryside heading to a larger city and after a few hours that carriage arrives in that larger city the princess goes and does as she's instructed to do And after doing what she's been instructed to do, she gets to spend just a little bit of time in a park in this city before she's going to head back in that carriage. And in the park she watches as some squirrels are scampering around a tree, almost seeming to defy gravity in the way they chase each other around with one squirrel almost managing to grab the fluffy tail of the squirrel in front. And then halfway up the tree, the squirrel in front seems to turn around, and the squirrel behind now seems to be running away from the other squirrel. Before one runs onto a branch, 
runs along the branch and leaps to another tree. And she watches them running around and playing for a while. She sees someone feeding a dove over by a lake. And it makes her think of her relationship with that frog, of just being able to have that one thing that you can communicate with, that seems to understand you. And then she gets the call that it's time to head back. And she's looking forward to being back to seeing the frog and explaining the previous day's events and the events to unfold that night. And back at the palace, she quickly changes, has a hot shower to help to wake her up and help her feel refreshed She's still tired from the long previous night, and she doesn't know what tonight will hold. And then she heads out into the garden. She heads round to that pond, and she sits down on that bench. And as she sits on that bench, so she hears a splosh, and then sees that frog jump up the other side of the pond. And that frog heads over, jumps up on the bench. And it's as if nothing had happened. She excitedly tells the frog all about her previous night. About how that tiny little tree that she saw months ago had turned into this giant tree that she followed all the way up to the clouds where she found some fairies panning for gold that said that they could grant her a wish and to meet her tonight. And the frog seemed to just sit and listen so peacefully, so calmly, so attentively And then as it got later and later, and the sun set, so that frog headed back to where it came from. And the princess just remained sat there, resting on that bench, waiting for the fairy to arrive, wondering whether the fairy would arrive. And as she sat there, she began to look up at the stars appearing overhead. While she looked up, she could see that there were some clouds obscuring some of the stars. She wondered whether, if she looked up towards the woodland, she would see that tree stretching up into the sky. And she saw the occasional shooting star pass over, that she almost thought she heard sparkle and crackle. And then she noticed some sparkling in the sky that seemed to be just gradually moving in her direction. Initially, she barely noticed it moving at all. It just looked like it was gradually getting slightly larger. But then that sparkling started moving and weaving as if it was flying down towards her. And after a little while, that fairy landed on the arm of the bench. And the fairy said that 
she's here to grant this wish. What is it that she would like? And the princess says that I would like to be able to talk with the frog and to have the frog be able to talk back to me. I'd like us both to understand each other, to be able to be true friends. I'd like to be able to lead the life that I want to lead and not lead a life that's dictated to me. And the fairy says that that can be granted. That you'll have one night and one day. And then the night after that will be a full moon. And on that night of the full moon, you'll come out here. And resting on the bench, you'll find some passion fruit, and you'll eat that passion fruit. And then you'll have one more night, and one more day. And then you'll be able to lead that life you talk of. But those extra days are days for you to make sure that's what you want. That once you eat the fruit, that's the life that you'll have. And the princess is already certain that is the life that she wants. But she's happy to wait those days if she has to. And the fairy flies off. And the princess heads inside. And the next day the princess begins to share with everyone that her life is changing, that she's going to start doing what she wants to do and that she's thinking of leaving the palace and may not be around again. And those around her explain that they don't like the idea of this. She's got a job to do. She's born into this role and she should do what she's born to do. And she explains that whether they like it or not doesn't matter. It's what she'll be doing that it's now time for her to take control of her life, to lead the life that she wants to lead. And she spends the next couple of days explaining her case. And over those couple of days, they accept that she'll do what she chooses to do. They're not happy with it. And they begin to make plans for what will happen to everything here, what will happen to the palace. And she explains she just wants those who can live here to remain here. And they talk through the agreements. And she decides who she wants to stay in the palace so that she knows it will be looked after off into the future, not just given to someone who may sell it straight away, but used by someone who would love to live in this palace and that'll make it a home. And then she heads out into the garden and the sun is beginning to set. And she talks with that frog. 
and then she sees that fairy arrive. And the fairy conjures up that passion fruit. And she consumes the passion fruit and doesn't feel any different. And the fairy says, it's done now. All the changes are set in motion. Like rolling a marble down a drain pipe. There's only one way for it to go. And the princess heads to bed, having said good night to the fairy and the frog. And when she heads to bed, the strangest thing happens that just as she's drifting asleep, she suddenly feels this jerky feeling, like she suddenly jumped or twitched or moved on the bed. And then she feels it again. And she gets woken up with this feeling like she's almost fighting with her bed, like the bed is trying to bounce around all over the room. And like she's struggling to stay on the bed. And eventually, after a while, she manages to drift off asleep and relax. And she wakes up the next morning, thinking about that strange experience. And feeling lucky that she doesn't normally have sleeping experiences like that. Normally, she settles down at bedtime and just drifts comfortably asleep. And that evening, she heads out. She talks with the frog like usual. And she starts to feel a bit restless, but heads into bed that night to the most beautiful full moon. And then that night, she again experiences this bouncing, strange, twitching feeling in the bed, almost like she's fighting the bed again, before relaxing from head to toe. And she really focuses all her attention, thinking to herself, okay, relax the head. Allow that relaxation to just gently spread down the neck, smoothing, relaxing, softening those neck muscles, relaxing down to the shoulders, so calmly, so peacefully relaxing those shoulders and allowing that relaxation with each and every outbreath to move down to the upper arms, down around the shoulder blades, around the chest, relaxing, softening those muscles, passing that relaxation down with each outbreath, down both arms, down to the forearms, all the way down to the palms of the hands, and radiating that relaxation down to the fingertips. With that relaxation increasing with each and every outbreath, as that relaxation spreads deeper and deeper down from the chest and the shoulder blades down the lower back, around the stomach, all the way down to the legs, really softening relaxing, smoothing those muscles in the legs, moving that relaxation down all the way to the feet, to the tips of the toes, with that calm, 
warm, gentle relaxation. From the top of the head all the way down to the tips of the toes. Relaxing so gently, so peacefully. So completely. Breathing in relaxation. Breathing out any tension. With each out breath increasing that relaxation. As any leftover tension is breathed out. And she tells herself this for a little while. Noticing her body becomes so still and calm and peaceful. As she drifts into the most pleasant sleep. And the next day she awakens. Feeling so relaxed so refreshed, so revitalized and full of energy for the day, and excited about what this day will bring. And as the day moves on, so she goes to that bench, she sits on that bench, and she waits for that frog. And then she hears that splosh and sees that frog jump out of the pond and come over and sit on the bench. And as the sun begins to set, so it casts the most beautiful golden light across the garden, across the flowers, the grass, across the pond, glistening and sparkling. And then she notices the strangest thing. She starts to have this feeling of glistening. And she looks down at her hands. And she can see golden sparkles around her hands, her arms, her legs, her body. And notices that she seems to be sparkling golden. And that sparkling begins to increase. And as it increases, so she starts to feel the most beautiful, comfortable tingling from the top of her head to the tips of her toes. And then she notices the light increasing, getting brighter and brighter around her eyes. So much so that she closes her eyes. And as she closes her eyes, she can still see the light. As it begins to fade, and she opens her eyes. And as she does, and as she does, she can see that frog looking back at her. And she notices that they're at eye level. And she looks at herself and realizes that she's turned into a frog. And then the frog moves its mouth and its throat. And she realizes that she can understand it. And for the first time ever, she can hear its voice and the way the frog speaks. And she responds to say, I understand you. And she realizes that she can understand herself just like she could before, but she's aware that the way she spoke, the frog could understand her as well. And the two of them sat there for a while, conversing and realizing they have so much in common. And the frog explains that they've got something to show you. 
and the princess follows that frog as they jump down from the bench and hop their way over to the pond. And they stop at the edge of the pond and look back as the princess jumps down from the bench and hops over to the pond. And then that frog jumps into the water. The princess follows and the frog makes sure that they're not that far ahead so that they can be seen as they swim. And then they pop up the other side and the princess pops up the other side and they hop through what to a frog is tall grass that seems to almost tickle the sides of the legs and the body and the nose while hopping through that tall grass. And then the frog hops into a hole in a tree trunk. The princess follows. And what she discovers inside that tree trunk takes her breath away for a moment. She can see that the entire inside of this tree is just covered in rows and rows of books circling around, level after level after level, all the way up the inside of the tree trunk. And that there are ladders that are on tiny wheels that reach up a few levels of books. And at the top of one of the ladders is then a point where the ladder pulls over to a platform. And on that platform is another ladder that moves around a number of levels. And the princess looks up as far as the eye can see at all of these books. And the frog explains that there's an entire world of magic that the princess has been unaware of until now that all the knowledge of this magical realm that sits over the top of her world is contained in this library and many similar libraries and that their day job is to keep an eye on the library to know all of these books to be able to know what book has what spell in it, to know what book has what knowledge in it, and to be able to find that book. And that all the magical creatures come to this tree and others like it, and they'll then find what they're looking for, and they'll supply that knowledge. And this is just the beginning of this world. And the frog hops their way to the back of this tree where there seems to be a tiny door. And the princess with a knowledge of her garden has an idea of which tree this is and of what should be the other side of the tree. And wonders whether they'll be able to see that big tree. And the frog opens the door. And as they open the door, and then they hop through that open door, the princess discovers that where they are doesn't even look 
like her garden. And the frog explains that there are two worlds that overlap. And occasionally, there are points that puncture from one world to another, where the worlds cross over, especially around those who believe in magic. Where those who believe in magic can almost will the two worlds into the same frequency, making the two worlds collide, and they may suddenly get a glimpse of a fairy, or a troll, or a giant, or a dragon. And often they go unbelieved. And then as people believe less, so the worlds mix less. But there are still these portals, like this door, that connect the worlds. And the two of them hop through this world. And the princess is surprised to see what looks like hundreds and hundreds of strange little fluffy creatures with the softest fluffy fur that looks like the slightest drop of rain would make them puff up into a giant furball. And yet, despite looking like balls of fluff, they have slightly scaly tails, with thinner fur on the tails. And up near their heads, they have slight scaly bits, almost like they've got a plate in their throat that's pointing backwards before they get to a head that looks a bit lizard-like. And then one of them lets out a slight squeaky noise and a tiny puff of fire and a little bit of smoke. And the princess realises that these are like tiny little dragons. And the frog explains that their furry coats are fireproof. But they've got those bits on their neck just to keep the fur away from the fire. Because although they're fireproof, they could still irritate the neck and can still make it so that they could end up almost sneezing fire accidentally. And then with a massive thud, the princess sees a giant dragon land next to those hundreds of tiny dragons. And the frog explains that here in this land, Dragons give birth to hundreds of dragons that they lay hundreds of eggs and they have to then raise these hundreds of baby dragons and it can be a lot to take care of. But everything here is so friendly and supportive that sometimes fairies will fly down and they'll want to ride on the baby dragons. And the baby dragons will have fun racing each other, with the fairies racing on their backs. That they can't fly yet, 
these dragons can only run, that their wings aren't suitable for flight until they're a few years old. And sometimes the giants will fly around on the giant dragons. that it just helps them to get from A to B so much faster. And the frog continues to guide the princess through the land and says, I'm going to take you to where I live. They said, I work in that library, in that tree, and after work every day, I've been going to that bench where I met you and I've sat there, I've listened to you every day. And I've been able to understand you. But you've not been able to understand me, so I've just sat there listening. But after work, I head home. And so they guided the princess past the dragons all the way down to a lake in this land. Only this lake was different, that the water running through this lake was brown in colour and had a chocolatey consistency. And the frog wouldn't say what it was just that it isn't chocolate, but in the same way that they said they've seen young children try and eat mud thinking it was chocolate. There are many in this land who try and eat this water thinking it's chocolate, only to realise it doesn't taste like chocolate when you try it. And they swim through that water, out the other side. And on the other side is what looks like a toadstool, with a door in it. And the frog says, this is home. And the frog says that they were told by the fairy what was going to happen that they were aware of the princess going up on that tree, going up to the cloud, that they've known what was going to go on. And so they've made up a bed where the princess can sleep. And then in the morning they can begin to look at what the princess wants to do with her life now. That she can explore, she can go on adventures, she can do whatever she wants to do here, she can revisit that garden or the other land. And they can find where she wants to live, but for now she can stay with this frog. And she can decide what she wants to do, whether there's any jobs that she'd like to do. That nobody gets paid to do anything. But everyone does something. Everyone has something they like doing, something they're perhaps good at doing. Or something that they want to do just to be helpful to others. That people take on roles to feel satisfied. And that they can go and meet the others that live nearby. That in the same way that from the land that she came from, there are towns and cities. Here there are towns and cities. And she can go and explore them all. And the princess settles down.
on that bed, in that toadstool. And she feels a bit odd while she's trying to lie comfortably as a frog for the first time. But drifts comfortably asleep, just as easily as she has done previously. But this time, there's a different quality to her sleep, that she knows that when she wakes up, her life is her own, that she's now independent and free to make her own choices and lead the life that she wants to lead. And with a smile and a sense of deep relaxation, she drifts and floats, so comfortably asleep, wondering what her future will bring, what her friendship with this frog will bring. And she drifts and floats into the most pleasant dreams and falls asleep so comfortably all night.